Good evening. Um, can we just give another round of applause for them? Because they did a great job. So my name is Nunzio DeMarcus. I'm the president of the Bristol Borough School Board. I'm going to keep it short and sweet because you're not here to see me. You're here to see Dr. Minetti. Um, but just want to give you a little history. Um, back in December when um, Dr. Schaefer announced that he was planning to retire, um, we were very grateful for his service, and we decided that we needed to start looking around and, and seeing what we needed to do to, to fill those big shoes. Um, so we got the assistance from the IU, um, and then we had a very comprehensive search process. Um, it was nationwide, and we started out with 25 uh, potential candidates. We narrowed it down to 12, and then finally to four. Um, and this was a lot of late nights, you know, uh, after work, you know, 10, 10, 10.30. Um, and we, we just got really, really great candidates, and um, we, we met with Rose, and we found the one. Um, so we were really happy to find her, and thanks to... Um, to her and thanks to uh, Joanne Parati. Um, just everybody did a great job. So anyway, um, without further ado. Well, I am not Dr. Manitti, so you are also not here, not here to see me. So uh, my name is Mark Hoffman. I'm the executive director of the Bucks County Intermediate Unit. The Intermediate Unit is one of 29 educational service agencies that support the schools and school districts of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And of course, the Bucks County Intermediate Unit proudly serves the 13 school districts in Bucks County, as well as countless non-public schools. One of our great joys and great honors is to work with the school districts in Bucks County on projects like this, finding a new superintendent. As you know, identifying and hiring a superintendent is one of the most important jobs that a school district board of directors has. And so it was our honor at the Intermediate Unit, myself, Joanne Parati, and the entire team, to work together with your board to identify the perfect candidate, as Mr. DeMarcus said, the one. So on behalf of the Intermediate Unit, thank you to Nunzio DeMarcus, the board president, Mr. John D'Angelo, the board president at the Bucks County Intermediate Unit and board liaison, and of course the seven other board members who are here tonight representing your community and identifying the ideal candidate for this school district. Tonight, the, pro the program is fairly straightforward. I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Manetti very shortly, and she'll introduce herself to the community. Then we'll transition to the stage for a couple of questions and answers. And then we'll end just the way that we started. Dr. Manetti will offer some closing remarks, and then Mr. DeMarcus will wrap it up. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Rose Manetti. I guess you are here to see me then. All right, so that's what the banner says up there anyway. Um, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, and thank you so much to the Drama Club for coming out and, and performing. They were wonderful. Can we give them just one more little round of applause for Drama Club? <laughs> so by a show of hands, how many parents do I have in the, in the audience? Very nice. How many uh, teachers? Very good. Very good. And um, just community members who are involved in, in various aspects of, of working with the Bristol Borough School District through different liaison agencies. So uh, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight and welcoming me, welcoming me uh, so beautifully to your school district and to your community. Um, you're probably wondering how a girl from Scranton ended up down here in, in Bristol, Pennsylvania. So I'm going to give you a little bit about my background because I know we're going to get more into um, my academic background and such when we move into the questions. So I was born and raised in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, I'm outside of Scranton. If you have any office fans in here, any office fans in here? Okay, well, all the props that they use in the office are actually things from Scranton, including some of the restaurants and such that they mentioned. So, um, the current school district I'm in right now is the Valley View School District, and if you look on the filing cabinet in one of the offices, the helmet from our football team is on the, uh, is on the filing cabinet as a, as a prop. So um, I, I said I was born and raised in Scranton. I'm going to back it up with just a little bit more than that. Uh, my parents are also from Scranton, but my father is originally from Italy. Um, my father was born in Italy, and he lived there until he was 10 years old. His father passed away um, from World War II, 
and my father came to live here with his aunt and uncle. He's the only one who came here when he was 10. He came to live with family members who did not speak um, in Italian, and he did not speak English. So he worked very, very hard, and um, you know, raised then, you know, met my mom years later. That's a whole other story. I won't bore you with all that detail. But um, the bottom line is my parents are, are both Italian. My mother's half Italian and half Slovak, so I grew up with one parent who's bilingual in Italian, and uh, my grandmother on my mother's side of the family who's bilingual in Slovak. So whenever people didn't want us to know what was going on, there was a lot of different languages going on in the home. Um, but, you know, they would just kind of keep that on the side. Um, but, you know, the bottom line to all that is when you grow up in an immigrant family, you learn two things. You learn a lot, but two things really stand out. Um, having a work ethic really, really stands out when you come from an immigrant family. Uh, they teach you how to work hard and to work all the time and to never, ever give up and to always be compassionate and remember where you came from no matter how far you get. And the other thing that I learned from my parents is a deep respect. Treat everybody as you would like to be treated, no matter what job they have or, or how, how they come into your world, that you are to treat everybody with respect. So I, I was born and raised on these core values. And I am actually the only one in my generation of brothers and sisters who went to college. Uh, my brother went into the service and my sister went into the workforce. And um, when I just told my dad that I wanted to go to college in Philadelphia, he was like, what are you going to Philadelphia for? What's in Philadelphia? So he begrudgingly <laughs> allowed me to go down to, uh, to Philly. And I, I spent four years um, at University of the Sciences in Philadelphia, um, where I got my undergrad degree in, uh, in biology. And then I moved back home to northeastern Pennsylvania where I started my teaching career. And I've been there ever since. Um, I've been a teacher, and I said we'll get a little more into my academic background, but I've been a teacher, I've been a vice principal, I've been a principal, I've been a curriculum director, and a superintendent. And each one of those jobs, in some ways, moves me a little further away from students and more into different aspects of school. But I try to never forget the most important thing that we're here for, and that's our kids. We are 100% here for students. We only exist as public educators and a public education system because of the students that we serve. So as long as we keep that in mind, and that's in the forefront of everything that we do, um, we will be successful because that's when we lay our head down in the pillow at night and we're thinking about what we did during the day, the most important piece is what have we done for kids. And if we did the right things for kids, then we can definitely rest easy that we're, we're moving in the right direction. So that doesn't answer, but how did, a, how did a girl from Scranton end up down here? Well, when I was in college at University of the Sciences, um, I, I met uh, Tony Minetti. And we ended up breaking up, as couples do, you know, college romances and such. But 20 years later, um, we ended up back together. And we have a blended family of five children. Um, my children, my own biological children, are 22, her, Amanda. And she is in her fourth year at University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. She's a pharmacy student, and she's finishing up her finals right now. Uh, she's studying hard. And my second daughter is 19 and she is at Temple University and she is an international business major and she is also in her finals right now. Um, my husband brings three children to our family and they are 11, 11, and 11. <laughs> All right, everybody take that in for me. Let it marinate. Let it marinate, yes. Um, so my husband is actually in the back. He's, that's Tony right there. In the, in the red tie. So we have this blended family, and for the past eight years, uh, we have been traveling the Pennsylvania Turnpike every single weekend. So it just depends who goes where, really depends on what the kids' schedules have been. My kids at the time were in middle school and high school, and his kids were not even in school yet, to be honest with you. Um, so we just decided that our kids would come first. And so we kept them where they were, for the years that my kids were all through school. Um, they graduated, my second one graduated last year, and now they're both down in Philadelphia in college. And um, so Tony's kids are in, in uh, fifth grade, 
Christian, John, and Claire, two boys and a girl. And um, it's, it's really just a hectic life that we're leading, trying to get, you know, kids to practice and, and kids here and kids there. So it's time that we bring our family together under one roof. And so with that, I was looking for, uh, you know, a, a movement in, in my job, of course, to see what, what would be a good fit. And I, I did a lot of searching and to kind of find out, like, you know, what school districts kind of fit my needs. Because, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and I don't want to go any place that's not a good fit for me and a good fit for the community. So when Bristol Borough came up, first I had to go, where exactly is Bristol Borough? Because it's so tiny. It's like if you look on the map, it's just a little tiny spot. You have to like blow it up a little bit to actually see it. And I said, well, this is very intriguing. Um, it looks you know, very small little community. I love that. I grew up in a very small community. I had 91 students in my graduating class at Mid Valley School District. So. I was like, okay, you know, nice. And I looked at the demographics. And then my husband and I came around. We'd, we've been kind of surveilling the community, if you, if you would. I've been eating at uh, Eatry and um, a, a, like the King George, excuse me, King George, um, the Cantina. So we've been, we've been sampling the local fair incognito because nobody knows who you are before you're on stage in front of everybody. So it's kind of nice. You kind of see what's going on. And we walked around a little bit. And we absolutely fell in love with the community. And when I came down for the interviews and I, I met the people that are here, sometimes you just click and you connect, and it's a good move. So that's why I'm here. Um, I'm here because I believe that you, you have great leadership here right now with your current superintendent. Uh, Mr. Schaefer does a wonderful, oh, Dr. Schaefer does a wonderful, wonderful do job. Everything. <laughs> We actually have, because the superintendent community is it's pretty small, there are only 500 around in the entire state. So we, we kind of have, uh, we all know each other just a little bit. If not, if we don't know each other directly, we know people who know each other. So uh, I have some friends when I was talking about Bristol Borough and was asking them, so, you know, do you know anything about Bristol Borough? And um, John Kopicki, who was at Central Bucks, he and I actually worked together in Scranton at one time. And so my first phone call was to John, and he said, He's the best. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. You're going to love him. Um, you're going you're to love that transition with him. And he does a great job with the school district. And also a friend of mine, Dr. Mayen, he's like, I was just sitting next to him. They did some kind of superintendent uh, forum together. So he is, his reputation actually goes far and wide. You would think in a small community that people don't know each other, but they really do. And they all have wonderful things to say about him. So thank you so much for all that you do for this community and the years that you put in here. It's, I'm sure that they all very much appreciate it. So, so and I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. D'Angelo. took me for a tour. You would think a small town wouldn't have a tour for you, but it does, because I got to see every, uh, all the different aspects and kind of how it all fits together this evening and, and the different pieces and the businesses and the, and the different parts of the community that are here. And um, it, you really have a great fabric in this community. You really have a lot to be proud of. And um, I'm just, I feel really blessed that I'm here and um, that I could be part of it with you. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> So we're now at the part of the event where we'll transition to a couple of questions and answers, and uh, we'll get started. So just as a reminder and for context, this is one of the most important components of the night because it allows Dr. Benitti to have a sense of what the community would like to know about her, and it also gives the folks in attendance a chance to learn more as well. Where do the questions come from? Quite simply, the school district had on its website and through emails, et cetera, an online form that was posted for folks to submit questions, and that was posted for uh, over a week. And we received a number of questions that we look through. We sort of make sure we get the spirit of the questions, and then we're going to talk about them now. All right. Following this question and answer period, Dr. Maniti will close with some remarks. Mm -hmm. Mr. DeMarcus will wrap it up. And we've got uh, beautiful sunlight. There's still cookies out there, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be on our way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Maniti, the, the board uh, got to know you through the interview process. Of course, the community's gotten to know you through 
the press release, and then of course that beautiful, those beautiful stories you just shared. What else about your background ex and experiences in education would you like the community to, to know about you? Sure. Um, I've, I've been an educator since um, 2003, when I graduated from University of the Sciences. Um, I graduated with a degree in biology, but I, had, I have certification in biology, chemistry, environmental science, and general science. So I have four certifications. I can teach sciences from K to 12. And um, I had the bio degree, and I thought, well, you know what? If Most people say I'll, I'll fall back into teaching if the, the science thing doesn't work out for me. I was the exact opposite. I was like, well, I'm going to go into teaching. And if the teaching thing doesn't work out for me, I'll go into science and I'll work in a lab. But I know that I need to be around people. And I know, you know, quite frankly, they would fire me in a lab in about five minutes because I just can't keep my mouth shut and just, you know, work independently like that. So I went into education. Um, I was a teacher in the Pocono Mountain School District for four years. And at the time, Pocono Mountain only had one high school. And it was a growing and expanding, expanding school district. So there were about 500 kids in a graduating class when I was there. Um, I loved the Pocono Mountain School District. It was very progressive, uh, but I was pregnant with my first daughter. And when I went on maternity leave, I ended up leaving the school district because it was a it was a commute through a lot of bad weather in order to get up to to Pocono Mountain. So I started then in the Scranton School District. Um, the Scranton School District is is an urban school district. It's large, um, but there are two high schools, and I was at West Scranton High School. And it's a building that was built in the 30s. It's three stories. It's one of those old, when you think of an old-fashioned school, West Granton is it. It's in the middle of a city block. And in a lot of ways, it's similar to Bristol in that it is a community school. There are no buses. The kids all walked there. Um, some of them walked pretty far, but they all walked there. And it was, they bleed blue at, at uh, at um, um, West Grant High School. So it was it, for 14 years, I worked there. I was a chemistry teacher. I was a biology teacher. I was an AP chemistry teacher. Whatever it was they needed, um, they would just say, Rosie, teach this class. I'm like, yeah, whatever. That's fine. <laughs> Put it on my schedule, and I'll show up, and I'll teach it. So I, I worked there, and I worked my way up uh, through the ranks, and I became the vice principal of West Granton High School. And then I had the pleasure of being the principal of West Granton High School. And um, so 14 years is a, is a long time to be in one place, and I really enjoyed every minute of it. But I came down to a, part, a point where I wanted to get my doctorate degree. And I just, it's very, very hard to balance. I had young kids at the time, and I also had all the events and such, because if you're going to, either you go in all the way or you don't do it at all. That's how I feel. So I didn't want to miss events with the kids, my own kids, and the West Scranton kids and um, not be able to do my studies 100%. So at that point, I decided that I would take a position as a curriculum director. So I became a curriculum director, and I worked as a curriculum director for six years at Abington Heights School District. It's an affluent school district in northeastern Pennsylvania. Their scores are, are very high. Um, and I had the pleasure of developing their STEM program for them and refining what it is that they did in mathematics and science. Um, so I did that for six years. And um, the Valley View School District um, needed a, a superintendent two years ago. And I just thought they, they had a lot going on. They had lost their superintendent. He had passed away. And he was a good friend of mine. And I knew what they were trying to build at Valley View. And I knew that I helped my friend Tom build that at Abington Heights. And so I, I put my name in and, you know, had the pleasure of, of working for the past two years in the Valley View School District. And um, they're, they're wonderful people in, in the Valley View School District. So, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm at right now. And again, it's, it's different. When your kids are home and they're in your house, you know, you're not even thinking about, okay, well, we'll blend everything together. Well, you know, well that'll come when we get there. And now this year I had an empty nest. And um, it was just kind of like, okay, now is the time for me to start looking. And in between, I do a lot of curriculum work. I also teach at Wilkes University. Um, I, I, te I teach quantitative uh, research methods. And I'm also developing a class for them for their superintendent uh, doctoral program. And I've written a lot of curriculum over the years. I've done curriculum for NASA. I wrote the AP Chem class for Penn Foster. Um, I really enjoy doing that kind of work and, and, and working in curriculum, working with teachers to make sure that we're, that we're doing the best we can for our kids. So that's, a, that's my, my background. And, all the different career paths that I have taken that have led me to Bristol. 
So of all your achievements, I'm still thinking about those triplet 11-year-olds. I think that might be really, and, and I'm also looking back for your husband. I have three dogs at home. I thought that was tough. I don't well, think, <laughs> we might debate. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I, would, I would say that at any given moment, either one could be more <laughs> difficult than the other. But they're getting bigger now. 11's not as bad as, as three. Three was, three was difficult, so. I'm but sure. they're getting bigger now. So uh, folks are interested in your communication style. Of course, they're getting a sense of it now with mm -hmm. you tonight. Um, when you take the reins, how are you going to manage communication in the district, making sure that all of the stakeholders get the information that they need? Okay. I am, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm very approachable. Um, I'm very, uh, I have the ability to, to really relate and, and to get into buildings and such. It's, it's very important to me that I am accessible to the community. So anybody who calls, you will get a call back. Um, if there are teachers or anything that have any concerns or things that you want to discuss with me, I'm more than happy to come to the buildings and talk to, to any of you with the ideas that you have. Um, and then as far as like communication on a mass level, uh, we, parents are so busy these days. It's not, it's not as easy for them to communicate as it, as it used to be. They're running in a hundred different directions with the students and all that. So I think we really have to utilize um, uh, electronic communication, Remind app, um, putting things on the website, putting things on social media, just to keep parents informed of what it is that's going on. Because if they, you know, if you have several children and they're running to five different sports and, and everything else that they have going on, how could you possibly keep up with everything that your kids, especially if they're in different schools, you know, different grades and such. So I would use a lot of um, electronic communication means to, to kind of keep everybody in the loop and make sure that we all know what's going on. But if you ever need anything, I'm certainly, I'm going to be around. And um, now you know who I am, so when you see me in the restaurants and such, you can, you can come over and, and say hello and let me know what you, what you have going on. Well, that was a nice segue because the next question is related. And a parent would like to know how you're going to gather input and feedback from the community, specifically students, parents, grandparents, faculty, staff. Well, the first way would be actually getting into the buildings. Um, as, a, as an administrator and especially a superintendent, sometimes it's hard. It, it's, you get bogged down in your office and, and you have things going on and budgets that need, you know, and deadlines that need to be met. But the bottom line is you have to get out to where the kids are and the teachers are and, and see what's going on. You don't know what's going on if you're in a building that there's, you know, a very small amount of kids that are in the, in the admin building. So my plan is to be around, is, is to talk to everybody and just kind of get a sense of, of where we are and, and where we need to be. So, and I would also do, I, I'm not sure because I know you're going through your comprehensive plan, um, but there are community surveys that we can put out to all the different stakeholders. And I'm not sure if that has been done as part of your process. Um, so if it's part of the comprehensive plan, it's already been done, then we would use that when I, when I come in, we'll use that feedback to kind of feel and gauge where we are. And if we did not do that yet, we will. If we have a set of data to work from, at the end of the year, we'll collect a second set of data uh, using those surveys and kind of feel where, where we are and have we hit some of the targets that we, that we need to hit. Because this is your school, this is your community, and your input is very, very valuable. So we want to make sure that everybody has a voice. You mentioning the surveys as a part of this process, the board actually surveyed the community and the staff to identify all the traits and characteristics they were looking for in you. Oh, so, wonderful. Well, I hope. I hope they, they got it dead on for you, right? <laughs> so you mentioned a lot about science in your background. You mentioned NASA mm -hmm. and um, the sciences, University of the Sciences, et cetera. So a parent has asked a question about science. Um, they'd like to know about STEM education. Okay. So that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And the ways you'll bring those core uh, programming elements to the district and bring the district to the forefront. Okay. Um, first, we'd have to do analysis of what you already have in place because you know STEM is science and mathematics in, in, in conjunction with technology and engineering. So you know, what science programs do you have already? What math programs do you have already? And then what can we add overall? If you're talking about STEM at the elementary levels especially, you really need to include the arts and reading into your STEM program and make it, I know they start adding all these letters, so that's like stream if you want to get all the letters in. Um, but the bottom line is everything has to be integrated when you're talking at the elementary level because learning how to read by third grade is, is one of the highest priorities that we have for our students. That really does 
um, tell us where, where our students are going to be. It's a pretty good indicator of where kids are going to be. So if you tie in everything you do to those reading comprehension skills as well, so it's not just STEM in isolation. It's not just doing engineering for the sake of engineering. Um, it's those hands-on discovery skills, the problem-solving abilities. Those are the things that we want to develop in our students. So I know that we're going to a one-to-one -one initiative here all the way down to second grade. And um, so what we want to do is use the, the computers that we have and the technology that we have available to teach kids coding skills, those, those problem-solving things where they have to break things into pieces, and really integrate that into what it is that we are already doing and not have a separate program that's kind of alone and they're doing STEM over here, but they're not taking in any of the other pieces on the other side. And then as we move up into the middle school and the high school level, um, what you need to do is take a look at, do we have uh, coding? Does coding go from block to more of a language? You know, do we have these pieces in place that will allow our kids to be competitive? Do we have some engineering courses available for kids? And if we don't, how do we acquire the resources in order to get those programs? Because a lot of that is, they're not consumable things. They're, they're technology and software and things that you need to bring in. But once you have them, you have them. So how do we go about getting that technology in the classroom? And then at the high school level, uh, where can we help students get the math and science skills that they need to be successful and competitive if they want to go into those areas or engineering? So really, it's, it's a comprehensive look, K-12 to in the district. Um, I love building STEM programs. It's kind of my forte. And um, I've, I've enjoyed doing it now in a few different districts. So I look forward to seeing what you already have in place and then helping you get to the next level with that. Exciting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another parent would like to know how you're going to evaluate the district's programmatic needs. You, you mentioned actually evaluating the stems of this ties in. Mm -hmm. So how will you evaluate program needs within the district given the constant financial pressures that every school district is facing? And then specifically, what strategies might you consider to look at programs that might have been cut? in previous budgets or perhaps programs that you'd like to reinstate but perhaps the district couldn't um, have afforded to? Okay. Um, well, first, we, like I said, you have to do a comprehensive evaluation of where you are um, and look at the programs, really look at curriculum, at curriculum instruction and assessment altogether. So how do, you, how do you go about looking at that? Well, you see what programs are already here. Are they being followed with fidelity? Um, or do we just have programs and we're just doing pieces of it and, and we're not kind of following along with what some of these uh, programs need to be. We can look at data that we have available and what other data do we need to bring in. So, you know, we have PSSA scores and that, that's a snapshot in one place in time. So it's an indicator, but it's not the only indicator that we have. So do we have some standardized assessments to take a look at and see where we are? Um, what interventions do we have in place for students? That's very, very important. We have kids who come in and, with all sorts of needs. Um, some need intervention and some need enrichment. And all kids are different. So we have to make sure we're meeting all those needs. So we look at the programs we have and the interventions and enrichments that we can put in place with those programs. And then, you know, looking at things that have been cut, um, it, it, it is a very different time now in, in public education. Um, gone are the times where you, you just had a lot of money that you can use to, to buy programs. So you have to really get what I like a bang for your buck, just to, to put it the way that it is. Um, and make sure that what you're putting in place, you, you have a great impact on your students for the value that it is that you're putting in and the resources that you're, that you're putting in. So some programs, you know, you look at, well, they were cut. How can we bring programs back and bring uh, avenues for students to achieve that have a, a purpose and that will get kids to where they need to be when they leave us in high school. So I think at this point with, with all that we have and the financial constraints that we have, we really have to be creative in a way that we never were before. We used to just be able to add programs and if, you know, if they took off, they took off. If not, then not. And, but now we have kids who can go to cyber schools, who can get different um, avenues that way. So we have to be a little more inventive in what we offer kids and maybe have a cyber program for kids of our own to allow them to, to uh, go out in different avenues. And then we have um, programs that are dual enrollment 
with the community college, how do we expand those offerings? How do we expand offerings for kids who would like to go into the workforce to get them the job skills that they need? So really looking at programs and not just from a mass perspective, which some programs need to be mass perspective, like reading programs and such, but then how do we drill down to the individual student and what can we do? How can we be creative to get them what they need so they can be successful in whatever career path they have? So with technology as it is now and the opportunities that we have for kids to take classes above and beyond what they can be offered, that can be offered within the school, I think we can meet a lot of needs that we never met before. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A parent asked to learn more about your philosophy specific to school culture and bullying. Okay. Specifically, the parent asked what experiences you have dealing with school bullying and, and in evaluating school culture. Okay. Well, in 26 years, you know, you run into a lot of different situations. Um, I think that I mean, we talked a little bit about the academic needs of students, but really another big component in, in educating the whole child is the mental health needs of students as well. And that falls into, into the avenue of bullying. Um, you know, kids come to us with greater needs now than they ever have before. So as educators, we really need to meet kids at their level and help them to adjust and, and to be successful both emotionally in school and academically in school. So looking at anti-bullying programs, it really if you're looking at a positive behavior support program, and bringing that in with Fidelity. And I know they do have a positive behavior support program here in the elementary school, but that's the foundation right there. Getting kids connected to the adults that are in the building. Um, if kids feel connected, then you have a, a lot less issues because kids know they can come to somebody and they can talk to somebody. Um, so having avenues for kids, get, teaching the, the teachers and, and training them to look for certain behaviors and to survey the kids in an informal way about what it is that they're feeling and what it is that they're doing, and really making those connections. And I think kids today really, they're facing things that, that we never faced when we were in school. Um, when we went home and we shut the door and we were in our own house, nobody else was there. And now kids have phones with them. And really, the outside world can reach them 24-7. And that's, that's kind of scary in some ways, because our kids are really being exposed to things all the time. So you know, when we say, oh, well, there were, there were bullies when we were young. Yeah, they were, but they weren't in your pocket. <laughs> and they didn't have access to you all the time. And I think really that's the big difference these days um, with bullying, is that we, we have to really train our students in cyberbullying as well and having a code of conduct when they're online and really teaching them what's appropriate and what's not on social media. And I think that if we can if we really reach kids at that level and make them understand that when they're behind the keyboard, they're really not anonymous and they're hurting other people, um, that's a big piece of bullying that I see now on a, on a regular basis. Kids will come in and it'll be about something that happened on social media the night before. So really tri uh, working with kids and, and giving them that development they need in order to understand the different aspects of bullying and, and to kind of work with them and give them an, an outlet um, if they have a problem, um, have some peer tutoring to go along with that and, and peer mediation and, and really be there for, for what it is that they need from us. So this is the last question. You'll officially take over as the superintendent this summer so could you share a little bit more about what your entry plan will look like? What can the community expect to see from you in your first 30 days, your first, first two months, yeah. the first year? All right. I have a very extensive 90-day entrance plan that I'm not going to read to you right now. <laughs> um, but in the, in, you know, just to kind of summarize it, the first 30 days, if I were to come in in August, um, my first 30 days would be just getting everything ready for the school year, uh, getting to know the people who are coming in and out of the buildings. I know teachers are coming in and out. Um, trying to get their classrooms all ready. So really just being there and trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of how everything works. Um, then in the, the next 30 days, it would be the entry of the school year. So I would really get into the buildings, get out to the games, and, and kind of get into the community and talk to parents and talk to kids and just kind of see, do some walkthroughs and just get a feel for what it is that's going on as I'm doing all the evaluations of things that we have in the, in the school district. And then by 90 days, I think I should have some real data 
to take a look at and, and kind of work with the groups that I have here and the stakeholders um, to come up with some uh, goals and objectives. I know we're going to build a comprehensive plan, so that will be a big piece of it. And getting to know the, the community members and how their pieces. Uh, this is Bristol Borough is not just the school district. Bristol Borough is the whole community. And so, you know, having that approach of how do we kind of keep those ties and really strengthen them and, and lean on each other to make sure that we're getting the most out of the education system and the most help we can from and with the community and for the community. So that would be my first, my first 90 days. Well, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Would you join me in giving Dr. Benetti a hand? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. So before we transition to Dr. Minetti's closing comments, I just wanted to thank, um, one last time, I wanted to thank Dr. Schaefer and the entire Bristol Borough administrative team. Um, it, takes, it takes a lot of work and coordination to make the school ready for an event like this so shortly after the, the day ends and to have a beautiful school with the beautiful banner and the flowers is set are ready to go. We, we appreciate that. Of course, thank you to the Bristol Borough Board. They did a wonderful job representing the community in this search. We applaud them as well for their work in identifying Dr. Minetti. And then in the back, it's not just us in the room here tonight. There are actually folks joining us online. This event was live streamed. It's also been recorded so that anyone who wasn't able to watch it or be here today it's recorded, and so I'd like to thank Paul Hetherington from the Bristol Borough School District, Dan Lazoch, and Ryan Wett from the IU. So without further ado, Dr. Manitti, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It feels odd being out there now being in front of the podium again, so I'm going to come back over here. Um, well, thank you. I just, a heartfelt thank you. To everyone um, who, who put the event together tonight, uh, for the kids to come out and sing, and the parents who brought them here, and um, you know, I really I appreciate it. I enjoyed your talents, and um, I, I really look forward to becoming part of your community. Uh, I really I would like to thank the IU um, for all the hard work. Uh, they have been working nonstop with me for weeks, just getting everything together, all the questions. When you're not right here it's a little more difficult to kind of bring everything together and, and fit all the pieces together. So I, I really I appreciate them so much for everything that they, that they did to make this night possible and to really make this transition for me a, a comfortable one and to know that I have um, somebody here in the academic end to, to help me along with it. So thank you so much for all that you did. Um, I would also like to thank the board members. Uh, from the minute I walked into the first interview, uh, I just felt a connection with the board members here. And, and I think that we will have a very strong alliance together to, to work together to bring this, this school district forward. Um, the superintendent can't do anything without the board and without the teachers and, and all the paraprofessionals who are in the buildings and the secretaries and of course all the students. It's one big community working together with one voice, with one goal. So we're, we're very, I'm thrilled to be here. And I, I thank you very much for coming out and taking time out of your evening. I know this is a tough time of year. Everybody's running around. And um, for you to take the time to come out here really means a lot to me. So thank you all very, very much for coming out. And um, stop over, say hello. Uh, it'll take me a little while to get everybody's names down because I know you all know each other. <laughs> And there's a very strong connection in this community, but it's going to take me a little while just to get everybody's names down. So please don't hesitate to come over and say hello. And again, thank you so much for the warm welcome. And I would like to also thank the, uh, the Teachers Association for the beautiful flowers that are on the table. Thank you so much for getting those. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm going to let everybody get out there and get some cookies that are left. Uh, but on behalf of the Bristol Borough School Board of Directors, thank you to everybody that came. Um, thank you to Dr. Hoffman, Joanne Parati, and of course, Dr. Manitti. So thank you. Have a good evening.